Good morning once again, everybody. Miss Pierce here. We are about to continue on reading S.C. Hinton's The Outsiders. We're going to continue on with chapter eight today. Crazy that we're already to chapter eight. Um, but remember, as we read, we're going to stop. We're going to talk about things. We're going to discuss things, kind of review some key points. Maybe I'll point out some like literary skills um, as we go. Uh, but just a quick recap, at this point in the text, everything is out there. Like, the press, the police, everybody knows what Johnny did. Um, they know that Johnny killed that Soch. They know that they ran away. Um, and surprisingly, instead of being painted to be villains, Johnny and Ponyboy are being made out to be heroes because the church caught on fire, which they might have set that fire unintentionally, but maybe the fire is their fault. But everybody's calling them heroes because they saved these kids from this burning building. So now we have this whole other moral conflict as far as, you know, should they actually be considered heroes because they've done this bad thing in their past? Does one good deed outweigh a bad deed? There's this whole other issue and debate going on in the text right now. And on top of that, we're still not even sure if Johnny is going to survive what's happened. We learned that he's going to be paralyzed if he even does survive. And now amongst all of that conflict, we have a big brawl happening between the socials and the greasers. We know that there's been conflict there between these two groups since, you know, before the time that the text even started. But now it's kind of all coming to a head and they're preparing for this big rumble. Um, so we're going to kind of see how that all plays out and who wins and if that rumble even happens in this chapter. I oh, know we got all the things happening. So hopefully you're keeping track with some graphic organizers to keep it all straight. But here we go. Chapter eight of S.E. Hinton's The Outsiders. It starts on page 119 if you're reading in this version. Here we go. The nurses wouldn't let us see Johnny. He was in critical condition. No visitors. But Tubit wouldn't take no for an answer. That was his buddy in there, and he aimed to see him. We both begged and pleaded, but we were getting nowhere until the doctor found out what was going on. Let them go in, he said to the nurse. He's been asking for them. It can't hurt now. Tubit didn't notice the expression in his voice. It's true, I thought numbly. He is dying. We went in, practically on tiptoe, because the quietness of the hospital scared us. Johnny was lying still with his eyes closed. But when Tubit said, hey, Johnny kid, he opened them and looked at us, trying to grin. Hey, y'all. The nurse who was pulling the shades open smiled and said, so he can talk after all. Tubit looked around. They treating you okay, kid? Don't, Johnny gasped, don't let me put enough grease on my hair. Don't talk, Tubit said, pulling up a chair. Just listen. We'll bring you some hair grease next time. We're having the big rumble tonight. Side note, interesting. Once again, we talked about hair being a possible symbol within this text. Um, Johnny's laying there. He's burned, might not even survive, and yet he's still concerned about his hair. Interesting. All right. Johnny's huge black eyes widened a little, but he didn't say anything. It's too bad you and Dally can't be in it. It's the first big rumble we've had, not counting the time we whipped Shepard's outfit. He came by, Johnny said. Tim Shepard? Johnny nodded. Came to see Dally. Tim and Dallas had always been buddies. Did you know you got your name in the paper for being a hero? Johnny almost grinned as he nodded. Tough enough, he managed. And by the way, his eyes were glowing. I figured Southern gentlemen had nothing on Johnny Kane. I could see that even a few words were tiring him out. He was as pale as the pillow and looked awful. Tubit pretended not to notice. You want anything besides hair grease, kid? Johnny barely nodded. The book. He looked at me. Can you get another one? Tubit looked at me too. I hadn't told him about Gone with the Wind. He wants a copy of Gone with the Wind so I can read it to him, I explained. You want to run down to the drugstore and get one? Okay, Tubit said cheerfully. Don't y'all run off. I sat down in Tubit's chair and tried to think of something to say. Dally's going to be okay, I said finally. And Darian and me, we're okay now. I knew Johnny understood what I meant. 
We had always been close buddies, and those lonely days in the church strengthened our friendship. He tried to smile again and then suddenly went white and closed his eyes tight. Johnny, I said alarmed, are you okay? He nodded, keeping his eyes closed. Yeah, it just hurts sometimes. I usually don't. I can't feel anything below the middle of my back. He lay breathing heavily for a moment. The truth of that last statement hit me. We couldn't get along with anyone or without him. We needed Johnny as much as he needed the gang and for the same reason. I won't be able to walk again, Johnny started, then, fal then faltered, not even on crutches, busting my back. You'll be okay, I repeated firmly. Don't start crying, I commanded myself. Don't start crying, you'll scare Johnny. You wanna know something, pony boy? I'm scared stiff. I used to talk about killing myself. He drew a quivering breath. I don't wanna die now. It ain't long enough. 16 years ain't long enough. I wouldn't mind it so much if there was so much stuff I hadn't, I ain't done yet, and so many things I ain't seen. It's not fair. You know what? That time we were in Wendricksville was the only time I've been away from our neighborhood. You ain't gonna die, I said, trying to hold my voice down. And don't get too up because the doc won't let us see you no more if you do. 16 years on the streets and you can learn a lot but all the wrong things, not the things you want to learn. 16 years on the streets and you see a lot, but all the wrong sights, not the sights you want to see. Johnny closed his eyes and rested quietly for a minute. Years of living on the east side teaches you how to shut off your emotions. If you didn't, you would explode. You learn to cool it. A nurse appeared in the doorway. Johnny, she said quietly, your mother's here to see you. All right, so Johnny's um, abusive alcoholic negligent mother is there to see him. Do you think that Johnny wants to see his mom or do you think that he would rather not see his mother? And like, how do you think he's going to react now? I'd be curious to see what you have to say about that. Well, let's find out. Johnny opened his eyes. At first, they were wide with surprise, then they darkened. I don't want to see her, he said firmly. She's your mother. I said, I don't want to see her. His voice was rising. She probably come to tell me about all the trouble I'm causing her and about how glad her and the old man will be when I'm dead. Well, tell her to leave me alone for once. His voice broke. For once, just to leave me alone. He was struggling to sit up, but he suddenly gasped, went whiter than the pillowcase and passed out cold. The nurse hurried me to the door. I was afraid of something like that if you saw anyone. Hold on a second. Johnny's mom shows up to see him. Maybe one of the first times that she possibly was going to show that she cared about him. And he passes out cold. Just think about that for a second. Like his mother, one of the people in the world that we are told and raised and like society expects that like out of all the people in the world for you to like trust and be excited to see typically a mother or a mother figure is going to be one of those people but not for johnny like he passes out at the sight of his mother that's crazy and that speaks volumes about the relationship between those two and the conflict that exists there for years and years and years let's keep going we're on page 122 the bottom of page 122 i ran into two bit who was coming in you can't see him now, the nurse said, so Tubit handed her the book. Make sure he can see it when he comes around. She took it and closed the door behind her. Tubit stood and looked at the door a long time. I wish it was any one of us except Johnny, he said, and his voice was serious for once. We could get along without anyone but Johnny. Turning abruptly, he said, let's go see Dallas. As we walked down into the hall, we saw Johnny's mother. I knew her. She was a little woman with straight black hair and big black eyes like Johnny's, but that was as far as the resemblance went. Johnny Cake's eyes were fearful and sensitive. Hers were cheap and hard. As we passed her, she was saying, but I have the right to see him. He's my son. 
After all the trouble his father and I have gone through to raise him, this is our reward? He is, he'd rather see those no-count hoodlums than his own folks. She saw us and gave us such a look of hatred that I almost backed up. It was your fault, always running around in the middle of the night, getting jailed, and heaven knows what else. I thought she was going to cuss us out. I really did. Tubit's eyes got narrow, and I was afraid he was going to start something. I don't like to hear women get sworn at, even if they deserve it. No wonder he hates your guts, Tubit snapped. He was going to tell her off real good, but I shoved him along. I felt sick. No wonder Johnny didn't want to see her. No wonder he stayed overnight at two bits or at our house and slept in the vacant lot in good weather. I remembered my mother, beautiful and golden like soda, and wise and firm like dairy. Oh, Lordy. There is a catch in Tubit's voice, and he was closer to tears than I'd ever seen him. He has to live with that? We hurried to the elevator to get the next floor. I hoped the nurse would have enough sense not to let Johnny's mother see him. It would kill him. Dally was arguing with one of the nurses when we came in. He grinned at us. Man, am I glad to see you. These hospital people won't let me smoke. I'm on out. We sat down, grinning at each other. Dally was his... Sorry. No phones in class. Uh, pause for a second. There we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> where were we? Um, we sat down, grinning at each other. Dally was his usual mean, ordinary self. He was okay. Shepard came by to see me a while ago. That's what Johnny said. What do you want? Said he saw my picture in the paper and couldn't believe it didn't have wanted dead or alive under it. He mostly came to rub it in about the rumble. Man, I hate not being in that. Only last week, Tim Shepard had cracked three of Dally's ribs. But Dally and Chim Tim Shepard had always been buddies, no matter how they fought. They were two of the kind, and they knew it. Dally was grinning at me. Kid, you scared the devil out of me the other day. I thought I'd kill you. Me? I said puzzled. Why? When you jumped out of the church. I mean, to hit you just hard enough to knock you down and put out the fire. But when you dropped like a ton of lead, I thought I'd aim too high and broke your neck. He thought for a minute. I'm glad I didn't, though. I'll bet, I said with a grin. I'd never liked Dally. But then, for the first time, I felt like he was my buddy. And all because he was glad he hadn't killed me. Think about that. We mentioned this a few chapters ago. Like, there's his perception of Dally and the way that he views him. It's starting to change a little bit. He's starting to feel a little bit differently about him at this point in the text because of all of those plot events that have happened than he did at the very beginning. And it's interesting now that he's, like, admitting it. Like, us as readers, we kind of picked up on it. But the fact that Ponyboy is admitting it himself... That's a big change. Top of page 125. Dally looked out the window. Ugh, he sounded very casual. How's the kid? We just left him, Tubit said, and I could tell that he was debating whether to tell Dally the truth or not. I don't know about stuff like this, but, well, he seemed pretty bad to me. He passed out cold before we left him. Dally's jawline went white as he swore between clenched teeth. Tubit. You still got that fancy black-handled switch? Yeah. Give it here. Tubit reached into his back pocket for his prized possession. It was a jet-handled switchblade, 10 inches long, that would flash open at a mere breath. It was the reward of two hours of walking aimlessly around a hardware store to divert suspicion. He kept it razor sharp. As far as I knew, he had never pulled it on anyone. He used his plain pocket knife when he needed a blade. But it was a showpiece, his pride and joy. Every time he ran into a new hood, he pulled it out and showed off with it. Dally knew how much that knife meant to Tubit, and if he needed a blade bad enough to ask for it, well, he needed a blade. That was all there was to it. Tubit handed it over to Dally without a moment's hesitation. We gotta win that fight tonight, Dally said. His voice was hard. We gotta get even with the socius. For Johnny. He put the switch under his pillow and lay back, staring at the ceiling. We left. We knew better than to talk to Dally when his eyes were blazing and he was in a mood like that. We decided to catch a bus home. 
I just didn't feel much like walking or trying to hitch a ride. Tubit left me sitting on the bench at the bus stop while he went to a gas station to buy some cigarettes. I was kind of sick to my stomach and sort of groggy. I was nearly asleep when I felt someone's hand on my forehead. I almost jumped out of my skin. Tibbet was looking down at me worriedly. You feel okay? You're awful hot. I'm all right, I said, when he looked at me as if he didn't believe me. I got a little panicky. Don't tell Derry, okay? Come on. Tubit, be a buddy. I'll be well by tonight. I'll take a bunch of aspirins. All right, Tubit said reluctantly. But Derry will kill me if you're really sick and go ahead and fight anyway. I'm okay, I said, getting a little angry. And if you keep your mouth shut, Derry won't know a thing. You know something? Tubit said as we were riding home on the bus. You'd think you could get away with murder, living with your big brother and all. But Derry's stricter with you than your folks were, ain't he? Yeah, I said, but they'd raised two boys before me. Derry hasn't. You know, wait, hold on. Yeah, I said, but they'd raised two boys before me. Derry hasn't. Once again, that relationship between now Derry and Pony Boy, we know that was a very strained relationship at the beginning because he hated how much Derry was on him all the time about what he needed to be doing or what he shouldn't be doing. And now we're seeing that relationship change. And we know that Pony's admitted it, but now he's admitting it to two bit too. Um, and acknowledging that, you know, the only reason that Derry is the way that he is with him is because he is inexperienced. He hasn't been a father before. And we need to remember that it's only been eight months since his parents unexpectedly died in a car crash. That's not a lot of time for anybody to cope with that, let alone somebody who is, you know, basically still a child themselves to have to parent two other children. Um, and Pony Boy's starting to recognize that and realize that. We're going to keep reading him. I know, or you know, the only thing that keeps Derry from being a Soch is us. I know, I said. I'd known it for a long time. In spite of not having much money, the only reason Derry couldn't be a Soch was us. The gang. Me and Soda. Derry was too smart to be a greaser. I don't know how I knew. I just did. And I was kind of sorry. I was silent most of the way home. I was thinking about the rumble. I had a sick feeling in my stomach, and it wasn't from being ill. It was the same kind of helplessness I'd felt that night Derry yelled at me for not for going to sleep in the lot. I had the same deathly fear that something was going to happen to, that none of us could stop. As we got off the bus, I finally said it. Tonight, I don't like it one bit. Tubit pretended not to understand. I never knew you to play chicken in a rumble before, not even when you were a little kid. I knew he was trying to make me mad. But I took the, hap the bait anyway. I ain't chicken, Tubit Matthews, and you know it, I said angrily. Ain't I a Curtis, same as Soda and Dairy? Tubit couldn't deny this, so I went on. I mean, I got an awful feeling something's going to happen. Something is going to happen. We're going to stomp the Socha's guts, that's what. Tubit knew what I meant, but doggedly pretended not to. He seemed to feel that if you said something was all right, it immediately was, no matter what. He'd been that way all his life, and I don't expect, expect he'll change. Soda Pop would have understood, and we would have tried to figure it out together. But Tubit just ain't soda. Not by a long shot. Cherry Valance was sitting in her Corvette by the vacant lot when we came by. Her long hair was pinned up, and in the daylight, she was even better looking. That Stingray was one tough car. A bright red one. It was cool. Hi, Pony Boy, she said. Hi, Tubit. Tubit stopped. Apparently, Cherry had shown up there bef before during a week Johnny and I had spent in Windricksville. What's up with the big times? She tightened the strings on her ski jacket. They play your way. No weapon. Fair deal. Your rules. You sure? She nodded. Randy told me. He knows for sure. Tubit turned and started home. Thanks, Cherry. Pony boy, stay a minute, Cherry said. I stopped and went back to her car. Randy's not going to show up at the rumble. Yeah, I said, I know. He's not scared. He's just sick of fighting. Bob, she swallowed, then went on quietly. Bob was his best buddy since grade school. 
I thought of Soda and Steve. What if one of them saw the other killed? Would that make them stop fighting? No, I thought. Maybe it would make Soda stop, but not Steve. He'd go on hating and fighting. Maybe that was what Bob would have done if it had been Randy instead of him. How's Johnny? Not so good, I said. Will you go up to see him? She shook her head. No, I, I couldn't. Why not? I demanded. It was the least she could do. It was her boyfriend who had caused it all. And then I stopped. Her boyfriend. I couldn't. She said in a quiet, desperate voice. He killed Bob. Oh, maybe Bob asked for it. I know he did, but I couldn't ever look at the person who killed him. You only knew his bad side. He could be sweet sometimes and, and friendly. But when he got drunk, it was that part of him that beat up Johnny. I knew it was Bob when he told me the story. He was so proud of those rings. Why do people sell liquor to boys? Why? I know there's a law against it, but kids get it anyway. I can't go see Johnny. I know I'm too young to be in love and all that, but Bob was something special. He wasn't just any boy. He had something that many people follow him. Something that marked him different, maybe a little better than the crowd. Do you know what I mean? I did. Cherry saw the same things in Dallas. That was why she was afraid to see him, afraid of loving him. I knew what she meant all right, but she also meant she wouldn't go see Johnny because he had killed Bob. That's okay, I said sharply. It wasn't Johnny's fault Bob was a booze hound and Cherry went for boys who were bound for trouble. I wouldn't want you to see him. You're a traitor to your own kind and not loyal to us. Do you think your spying for us makes up for the fact that you're sitting there in a Corvette while my brother drops out of school to get a job? Don't you ever feel sorry for us. Don't you ever try to give us handouts and then feel high and mighty about it. I started to turn and walk off, but something in Cherry's face made me stop. I was ashamed. I couldn't stand to see girls cry. She wasn't crying, but she was close to it. I wasn't trying to give you charity, pony boy. I only wanted to help. I liked you from the start, the way you talked. You're a nice kid, pony boy. Do you realize how how scarce nice kids are nowadays? Wouldn't you try to help me if you could? I would. I'd help her and Randy both if I could. Hey, I said suddenly, can you see the sunset real good from the west side? She blinked, startled, then smiled. Real good. You can see it good from the east side too, I said, quietly. Thanks, pony boy. She smiled through her tears. You dig okay. She had green eyes. I went on, walking home slowly. All right, so that is the end of chapter eight there. So we did not get to the rumble this chapter like we were maybe predicting that we would, but there's definitely a lot of preparation for this rumble. And it's interesting to note that so much of their preparation for this rumble isn't necessarily physical in nature, but a lot of it's mental. And a lot of it is learning how these different people all feel and who's ready to fight in this rumble, who wants to, who wants to not even show up at all. You have these characters that are now facing, some of them, um, these now internal conflicts as far as do I, don't I? Is this really the right thing? Is this really not? So we know that they're prepping for this man versus man, this physical conflict, but there's this whole like internal personal conflict happening ahead of it. And it's just, Emotions are high right now at this point in the book, and we can expect that because when we think about our plot diagram, we are definitely in that rising action, and we're about to get to the climax of this novel where all this crazy action happens. So we know that things are just building and building and building right now, and it's going to be interesting to see how they all play out. So I hope that you enjoyed that chapter that you're eager to read on. If you have comprehension questions, go ahead and get started on those now. Um, and if you are watching this from somewhere else and you have a question, go ahead and leave it in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to you. Thanks for watching.